Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming down to our second workshop. Um, today, we'll be covering Nakamoto consensus and Bitcoin protocol. For those of you who missed our first lecture, we have already posted the recording, the video, and the slides online uh, in our Telegram group. So you can go back and watch it. And today, we, at the start of the today's session, we'll also be doing a bit of a simple revision on what we have covered, some of the key concepts. Okay. So just let you know that uh, if you want to ask any questions, first of all, you can interrupt me anytime. For those of you who feel shy or are unsure about your question, you can always go to uh, the URL at the, uh, at the top of the page, and then you can ask questions over there, okay? Um, and once people you know, upvote your questions, I will, get, I, I will try to answer those questions, you know? So do feel free. If you wanna try it out, uh, please, it's okay, it's always on the top, anyway, okay. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Alex, and this lecture series, uh, lecture series is brought to you by Blockchain NTU, okay? Um, I know like most of you are our members and we're really familiar with each other, but for those who are watching these videos or who don't know who we are, uh, basically we are a student-initiated nonprofit academic club here at NTU, uh, and we're dedicated to fostering a vibrant blockchain communities here at NTU and beyond. So what we're committed to do is basically building the strength and strengthening the technical expertise as well as some market insight from our, uh, our members to um, you know, help them on the, in their pursuit of you know, their, their career in academia, in industries, uh, or even in their um, entrepreneurial journey. So that's who we are. And what we do, uh, we have three pillars, education, R&D, and consulting. Uh, in terms of what do we exactly do, please go to our website, and we'll be posting more information about uh, our events, our programs, um, and some you know, public free resources for anyone who want to learn uh, blockchain in general. Okay, so this is the agenda that we have uh, shown to everyone uh, since the last lectures. We start by uh, the first three items on this agenda list has already been covered in our first lectures. So we start by describing what happens before Bitcoin came about. Why does it even uh, came to, you know, came to the same and what happens in 2008? And that's where when Bitcoin was born. So the, the, the motivation of Bitcoin. Okay. And then we move on to some fundamental you know, uh, data structure basics as well as some cryptographic basics uh, that's, that's empower uh, blockchain to games about. Okay. So uh, for that, we are using all of those. We are able to build a secure digital ledger with that. Okay. And then the last thing we talked about last time is the pseudonymity, which is uh, the identity on blockchain. Okay. So for this lecture, um, today we'll be covering the last two items uh, on this agenda which is basically what we're we'll talking about uh, for the Bitcoin basics, okay? Uh, today, we'll be covering Nakamoto consensus, which is the distributed consensus algorithm uh, in Bitcoin protocol. And also, we're going to put, put everything together to present a holistic view, uh, you know, and overall, uh, you know, the, the protocol, the, the, the detailed protocol, uh, I mean, uh, present the, the protocol in details, okay? Uh, just to remind you, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, throughout these two lectures, the goal that we're trying to achieve is we're trying to build a secure digital cache with pseudonymity without central authorities, okay? This has been, as I said, a recurring thing over and over again. And through the workshop of, uh, through the last workshop, we have solved the first two lines and we're taking a modular approach. We're, you know, decomposing Bitcoin protocol into different, um, you know, uh, components. And we're, right now we're trying to combine everything together, okay? So once again, we already cover uh, the data structure and the cryptography which help us solve the first line, which is how do we build a secure digital, digital cache. Then we introduced the identity on Bitcoin, which we, solved the sec which we used it to solve the second line, which is how would we achieve the pseudonymity um, on Bitcoin network. The third one is the, the thing that we're gonna cover today, which is how do we use distributed consensus to, do, um, to build such a ledger without any central authority, okay? okay? Once again, this is something that we're gonna cover today. Okay, so before that, uh, I wanna refresh your memory on some of the key concepts that are essential and very critical uh, for you to understand anything you know, uh, in, in the blockchain space and also something you know, fundamental to our today's lecture. So uh, we wanna review this, what we so-called the most important pictures uh, from the last lecture, okay? And by the end of this revision session, you should be able to describe it by yourself, okay? So I just wanna refresh your memory. We already covered everything um, inside this picture and you should know why every component is up there and you know, uh, what are they used for, okay? So this, has, this is a Q&A question where I'm the one who asks you. Um, 
First of all, DSA. What is DSA and why are we using DSA? Um, anyone? Please. Anyone? Give it a try. It's okay. It doesn't bite. Come on. No one? Yes. So DSA stands for Digital Signature Algorithm. So what does it do? Yes. Right. So, uh, and yes, that's a that's a perfect answer. So, uh, just to rephrase what you uh, what you just answer is basically there are a pair of keys, and what DSA or digital signature algorithm is used for is trying to prove something that is actually you know signed by you. So we're trying to create something that's unforgeable. So we're Remember, there's a, the problem is we're trying to build an unforgeable stamp in the digital world. And that's where we introduced this cryptographic primitives called DSA, come to world, where you have a private key that's only kept to yourself. You're not revealing that to anyone, okay? But the private public key, you can broadcast to everybody that you want to communicate with, okay? So when you are trying to prove that something is actually said or came from you, originated from you, what you do is you use the private key, sign on a uh, original plain text message, and then it will result in a digital signature. Okay, so this is the digital signatures. Okay, and let me try to use a pointer. So there we go. Okay, uh, then when someone is trying to verify that something is actually from you, what it will take are three parameters. Okay, we have to repeat this many, many times. You will have to take your public key as well as the digital signature and the original message. And what we output is zero or one, basically yes or no. Does this come from you or not, okay? Um, so you will validate the digital, digital signature using verify function, okay? So that's DSA. Is everyone clear? Anyone has any questions? No, that's great. Okay, next one, hash functions. What it is, what properties does it have, and can anyone give an example of a hash function that we uh, listed out last time? Come on. Go ahead, please. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, can you give an example? Right. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a Good answer, but not entirely correct. So it's like uh, you are described. What, what you are describing is a hash pointer. Okay. So hash function itself is basically just something. Let's say it's a it's a meat machine where you took a long plain text and you digest it to a shorter fixed length uh, digest. So the input is arbitrary length, as you said. Uh, it, it, can, it can use beyond just in the hash pointer data structure. It can be used somewhere else as well. So the, the point of why are we using hash function is basically we want a shorter representation of the original message, of the arbitrary length data, uh, data itself, okay? So why do we need that? You remember the problem statements that we have last time is that we're trying to bond the coin transfer function, a uh, coin transfer transaction with a coin creation transaction. So we want a shorter representation of the coin creation so that we have a you know a shorter uh, we have a bond between those okay so uh, like we said this is the example that we give out uh, which we have a arbitrarily long uh, text and what it comes out is a fixed length digest okay so what is uh, that that is the hash function so what property does it have uh, we mentioned a few uh, namely some of the most uh, you know obvious and, and and the one that we need to remember first of all is that um, if you change anything even a little bit in the original plain text, the output, uh, the, the digest is gonna be completely different. Uh, another thing is this one witness that we see a lot, where it's also uh, something we see in digital signature DSA, where from the public key, you could not derive back to the, the, the secret key. So it's the same thing here uh, in hash functions, where from the digest, there's no way you can um, calculate the original plain text. Okay? But theoretically, as we said, it is theoretically possible to find collision, right? But it's just, uh, probabilistically speaking, it's just astronomically impossible to find. Uh, the probability is just too small, okay? So an example, of course, we mentioned SHA-1, which is used in GitHub. Uh, SHA-256 is something that we used in um, Ethereum and Bitcoin. And we also mentioned SHA-3 uh, and KCAT256, um, uh, which are you know, two different uh, hash functions, okay? So the next thing is hash pointers, what and why. I think you just answered that uh, perfectly. Basically, I, I wanna emphasize 
on why, okay? The reason why we use hash pointer, as we mentioned last time, is we're trying to solve this double spending problem, okay? The way that we solve this double spending problem is that um, we are putting the transactions in order so that we know which one came earlier, okay? So if you're trying to spend, because in digital world, you can copy that, you can copy the same digital coin however you want, right? It's just a copy paste things, okay? So in order to prevent that from spending the same coin to different people, what we do is we put into this um, you know, ordered log so that um, when something comes later, you can see, you can always refer back, um, and there's no way you can change uh, the history without other people noticing. Next question is a slightly harder. What is UTXO and what are some of the fields in the UTXO? Anyone? Yeah. 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 And is there, are there any other things? Okay, very close. Yes, so um, that is correct. So UTXO stands for unspent transaction output, okay? So this is the data, this is the model that uh, Bitcoin uses to record any transaction. So for every transaction, you have uh, pr primarily, uh, primarily three fields. You have inputs and outputs and the signature from the one who's, uh, from the input, uh, you know, the coin holder, okay? So those are the three fields that you have to particularly remember, and this is very important. So. Let me, uh, so the way that, the analogy that we could do is this, this, every transaction is like a pool of water and you have uh, several pipelines that's funding the, the pool and several pipelines that uh, shows you where does it direct to, okay? So uh, all the input are previous UTXO. So previous coin that hasn't been spent yet. That's why we call unspent transaction. Some transaction that hasn't been spent yet, okay? So where you, we're spending something that has been spent yet and use it to fund it a new transaction and it goes out to your new owner of this coin, or at least some denomination of this coin, okay? So in, in this example where we have, first of all, we have Alice transacted to Bob. So uh, first of all, they have to get the permission of Alice, and we're using DSA here, where Alice signed on this particular message saying that I'm willing to spend it to the public key of, Bo of Bob's public key, where Bob can later on uh, sign that, okay? So, uh, and later on when Bob is trying to send it to, uh, to uh, Charlie, and he's not trying to, he's not willing to spend the entire two Bitcoin uh, to Charlie. What he did is you want a, a bit of a ch change to yourself. And in order to do that, you just specify two outputs. One of them is your, yourself. And that's how you do like a change, keep your change, okay? So basically every transaction, in every, um, you, you can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Okay, so you concatenate the entire UTXO, it's gonna be a huge graph and um, your balances, how you calculate your balances is calculate all the UTXO that is belo that belongs to you and you haven't spent it yet. Okay, those that's how you calculate the balance, you know, in Bitcoin. Once again, it's different from what we, you know, intuitively think that the bank are, is, is trying to do. So bank is this state model, um, which where you ask, you have a key and value pair. The key is your address or your account. The value is the balance. Okay, so it's, it's a very simple one-liner entry, whereas in the Bitcoin case, the way that you calculate your balance is different, where you have to aggregate and accumulate all of the uh, unspent transaction that belongs to you in order to get, to add them together to get your total balance, okay? All right, so the next one is something that a lot of people, according to the feedback, because I think we're rushing a little bit uh, towards the end last, uh, during our last lecture, so I think uh, maybe we need to spend some time on doing reviewing on the uh, Merkle tree. So why do we need it? What is it? And why is it useful? Anyone have, can answer this question? Merkle tree, why does it, why do we need it? What it is and why is it useful? Okay, so maybe I'll just answer it. Okay, so uh, visually what you should have is, the, is something right here at the, uh, the right button right here. So this is something that you should always keep in mind. This is what a Merkle tree looks like, okay? So as we said, this Merkle tree, at the top of the Merkle tree is the root of the tree, okay? It's called a Merkle root. At the bottom, very bottom, is so-called leaves, okay? These are the leaves. It's a perfect analogy of the real tree in our real life, okay? So the leaf node, the value of the leaf node is the hash digest of the, the actual transaction, 
Okay? So the actual transaction is a plain text that has many, many other information. It can have, uh, it's, it's sent from so someone, it's going to someone, it's, uh, there's going to be a month, uh, there are going to be, for example, timestamp, there are going to be maybe extra information. Okay? So the transaction itself is actually a pretty long, and also arbitrary or a variable length. Okay? Uh, but then the leaf node itself, which is over here at the bottom, it's going to be a short digest, fixed length. Okay, so and every parents or every uh, nodes, every intermediary nodes, the intermediary nodes in this value, which is our all of the nodes that's in this red box over here, they are all called intermediary nodes. Okay, so their value is calculated by uh, concatenating its left children, the, its left child, and its right child. Okay, concatenate them together and then hash them. Okay, so that's the value of all each one of these um, intermediary nodes. Okay. And also, similarly, this is how you calculate the root node as well, okay? So once again, uh, instead of broadcasting every transaction or including every transaction, which is very, very long and also variable in length, into the block header, the block itself, what we did is that we only put the Merkle tree, the Merkle root into the block headers. And why do we need that? It's because we want to provide a more efficient way to prove uh, to, to, for proof of membership. Okay, proof of membership meaning that I want to prove certain transaction is actually include, uh, is actually a member of this block, okay, without actually recruiting, or actually in including this, okay. So the example that we give is that if let's say I want to prove the transaction X3 over here, um, as you, if you can see my pointer, um, if I want to prove that X3 is a member of this tree or a member of this block, okay, what we need to do is only provide the cousin node, the value of the cousin node along the path from the bottom to the top, okay? Meaning that the cousin is the one, you know, that shares share the same parents as you do, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the adjacent node over here. So you have to provide this value, um, you know, y4 and then y9 and y14. So with these three value, uh, anyone can just calculate it using this rule because they can calculate all the intermediary nodes using this, this rule. Uh, where you just concatenate the, the two children and then hash them. So uh, basically, people can um, cal calculate the root, the, the Merkle root, and then they see whether the, it, it actually matches with the root that people published. Okay, so that's how you do an efficient, um, efficient proof of membership. Okay, so once again, the path that I just mentioned about from bottom to top is called a Merkle path, or sometimes called a Merkle proof. All right. Now the nice thing, of course, is that uh, the proof size. Of course, what we, what we mean by efficient, it means that the size is much shorter than if I have every transaction inside the block. Just put it, put it there, right? So uh, the, the size is uh, log of n um, times 256. 256 is basically how long that each digest or each node value is. Um, and the height from the bottom to the top is a log n, okay? It's the size of a log n. Okay. Hope everyone see that. If you have three layers, then you have two to the power of three, which is eight nodes. So so it, it does not grow exponentially or even linearly with the number of transactions you have, okay? So in, in, um, versus if you have inclu include all the transactions, which is going to be a huge proof size, right? All right, so I hope by now, let's come back to this, the most important pictures that we mentioned um, last time that you have to keep in mind. And this is also the, the first assignment. I'm not sure, like, just raise your hands. Um, how many of you actually did the assignments? At least the first one. Okay, that's great. Uh, who did the reading? The second one. Awesome. Anyone think of anyone think of the third questions? How do you prove proof of non-membership? Okay, that's all right. So um, I'm still glad that you know uh, some of you have already done the first two, uh, the reading as well as the the, the self description of this, this graph because this is super important. So let me probably just quickly go through once again. Uh, because we have already refreshed your memory on all the basics, okay? So uh, when we, people are talking about blockchain, they are talking about this chain at the top, okay? So these are what, what's being actually uh, recorded. And also, of course, I mean, everything, all the transactions are sort of being re recorded. But at the same time, within the block header itself, you have, first of all, previous hash, which is constitute the uh, hash pointers, okay? That refers to the previous block, okay? So you want to indicate this is my parents, not anyone else. I want a short representative a short representation of my parents, okay? Then there, there is a timestamp, which is basically uh, when this block is being produced, 
So um, at least it gives an idea of like uh, who came first. As long as this timestamp is like bigger than the previous one, it's, it should be considered as a legit one, okay? Uh, then the next one is the nonce. Uh, the nonce I will be introducing in this lecture, what it does and why does it even exist there. And the, the, the last one is the transaction root or the Merkle root of um, which consists of all the transaction, which is the, uh, for, 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 for the transaction tree over here. And at the very bottom, every transaction basically looks like the UTXO model, okay? I hope this visual representation really gives you a, a good idea of how does it look like. And you can probably describe to even a 10 years old what blockchain is at this point. You know. Okay, great. So uh, some of the properties that with this up until now, that the, the, the current blockchain that we have or the data structure that we have that can provide. Okay, I want to, I want to point out four points. The first is uh, non-repudiation. So what does it mean is that if you broadcast or your transaction or something you said has been included in the past, in the history, there is no way you can repudiate, meaning deny that you didn't say something because everyone has that kind of data and they can trace back to the history and check. So, and also um, th there's no one, no other people can forge your signatures. That's one of the reasons it's non-repudiation, okay? You said something, it has to be said on, it has to be originated from you because only you have the private key, okay? So that's the first property. The second property is that temper evident, okay? Um, temper evident meaning that if someone is trying to temper with the history, meaning that while trying to mutate the history, change the history, then it should be evident. People should see that is invalid because he already have the current, the, the hash of the current block. So he can always dedu deduce back, right? People can always calculate uh, from the Genesis block to the current block and see whether the thing that you provide to him is correct, okay? So temper evident, once again, is that once you want to double spend, it's very evident. People can always verify because it's something in the history. Okay, then the third properties is that we can do efficient proof of membership. Okay, once again, this is done through Merkle tree. The last one is uh, the, the second point that we mentioned in, in our goal, which is the identity on blockchain. It's permissionless. Permissionless meaning that you don't need anyone's permission to join this network. And how is so? Because if you, for you to establish identity on the Bitcoin network, all you need to do is randomly select a private key, derive your public key, and then there you have it. No one can stop you from creating thousands or millions of identities on the Bitcoin networks. So that's where um, you, can, and you, you can start trans transferring money um, once you, you already have your private, once you have a private key, your key, key pair, and you, you, you have your identities on, on, on the Bitcoin network. So that's called a permissionless network, okay? So that's the kind of properties right now that we have. Now, uh, that's the, for, for the revision. Anyone have any remaining questions? Okay, sure. Which is? Which one? Can you upload? Uh, is, is it the uh, Bakun, Dem? Okay, so the question is, I'm trying to build a DAP. DAP means decentralized app. Um, what data are typically stored in the web server and what data should be stored in the chain? Okay, so uh, first of all, Anything, so th th this is, first of all, this has to be um, application specific. It really determine det um, storing anything on blockchain is expensive, okay? Uh, as we'll explain later on, because everything is replicated throughout the network. Every node in this network is having a copy of that. So it's much more expensive to store something on blockchain compared to store something on Google Cloud, for example, okay? So um, when you are trying to build a decentralized applications, um, the web server, I'm, I'm, I think the, the web server you're referring to is the one that you have, okay? Um, so it depends. I don't, I don't think it makes perfect sense to have to ask everyone, every um, application out there to move their business logic from the current existing, you know, traditional application to, to the blockchain space, okay? So the very likely case is gonna end up with a hybrid model where part of your logic, part of a business logic that requires a trustless interaction with a different, you know, um, uh, you know that people who, who are, who doesn't trust each other, so you want to facilitate this kind of interaction, that makes sense to put that part of logic, business logic on the blockchain. Then for the rest, for example, if you want to do uh, like authentication, you want to do a user logging, it doesn't make sense to put it on, on blockchain. Plus, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, everything that you put on blockchain is going to be transparent to everyone, okay? So even if you want to do like, a, I don't know, a, um, you want to you hide some secret, then you have to encrypt that secret and then put it into the blockchain. Do not just do it uh, in the plain text because everyone is able to see it, 
Okay, blockchain is this global database that everyone has access to. Okay, so um, I think it will make more sense when when we comes to our next and the next after the next uh, workshop when we explain smart contract and how we do program, how we pro uh, you know and all those you know architectures that for for any central application. Then later on we can refer back to this question. But uh, thanks thanks for the question. All right, so let's move on. Uh, today, we're gonna solve the, the third line over here, which is the last line, which is the very, very difficult, but the most interesting part, okay? How do we do it without central authorities? Now, when we talk about authorities, it has been you know, uh, discussed in, in various contexts, right? So what do, we, what do we exactly mean when we talk about authorities? Uh, in our context, or in our Bitcoin context, there are four relevant questions, okay? Let me slow down a little bit. So these are the four questions. You have to think about it right now, okay? The first question is, who maintain the ledger, okay? In the traditional application or the centralized model, what you usually have, if we're talking about money, is the bank. Bank is the one who maintain the ledger. The ledger is something that keeps track of who has how much money. Okay? The, the second question is, who decides which transaction to include, okay? Transaction can be generalized just beyond just you know update of balances. It can be generalized to state updates, right? It can be different states, right? If you, your age is 26, uh, then next, next year you're gonna be 27. That's a, that's a state update. If the bank is keeping track of your age, for example, then that is also a state. So that you can consider that also as a transaction, okay? So just, just to make sure it does not only limit it to balances itself. So in the centralized model, bank is the one who decide which one to include. And he has, he's the one who have to verify that if you wanna do a transaction at a prime supermarket, for example, then that transaction is actually coming from your phone, from your credit card, for example, right? So the third question is who gets to propose the next block? What does it mean is that, uh, as we say, in every block, you have a lot of transactions. So who gets to choose to propose this block? Um, of course, in a bank, in a bank scenario, um, what does these questions convert to is gonna be uh, who decides which package of transaction that you include. Because uh, within every second, the bank is gonna hear more than, more than he could handle, right? He could hear more transaction than he could handle. For example, he could hear a million transactions, but his capacity is only able to deal with 10,000, for example. So who decides which part of the transaction, or which part of this one million transaction does get into the next, does get confirmed in the next seconds? So um, in the centralized model, bank is the one who decides, okay? So the, the, the fourth question is, who creates new coin? Who gets to print new cash into this pool and increase the supply of this digital money? And in the digital world, or the one that we have right now, it's basically the government, who's the one who can print the cash, okay? And then he, he will notify the banks, for example, and they will have, you know, book checking. Now, um, you, you should start thinking about, like, what is the uh, counterpart in the peer-to-peer -peer network where no one is the authority, okay? So let me probably just rephrase it using a more visual tools. What happens if, if you have a central authorities who's keeping all the ledgers, okay? He's very cool, he's very hippie. This, um, Dictators, what he do is that he's using a blockchain, okay? All the data is stored exactly like what we just described so far. He's also storing in a hash pointers, okay? He's the one who maintain all the hash pointers and put them into the Merkle tree, uh, put the Merkle root into the block, block headers. He's the one who's doing everything, okay? Now, if we have Alice and Bob and have a group of people who wanna submit a transaction, um, that's, there's no problem. All they do is tell the, the dictators and the dictators will just include them into the next block. Okay? He will be handling everything, and there's no problem with that. He have absolutely say of who gets included. If he doesn't like Bob, um, then he can just censor Bob and does not include any transaction from Bob at all. Okay? Now, what happens if we are a, in a more democratic or more you know, uh, decentralized scenario where we do not, do not have such a um, you know, uh, dictators? Is that, let's say, Alice and Bob all of them, both of them have a ledger who's also recorded like what we did in the, uh, the, the hash pointers. Uh, now, when they're trying to do a transaction and the rest of them, because we now don't have, do not have a central authority who helps you maintain this ledger. So everyone is sort of like maintaining a copy of the ledger. 
Now, if Alice and Bob try to do a transaction and he's trying to tell the rest of the people, now if the people on the right hear about it and update their ledger, but then the people on the right didn't, okay? So when someone asking the network, how much does Alice have and how much does Bob have right now, there's gonna be a conflict or at least there's gonna be a disagreement be between them, right? So that's the problem that we're trying, essentially trying to achieve here, where if you ask a, p a group of people, uh, they can give you a different answers. Right? So they sort of they have to come to agreements of what is uh, the canonical idea. So uh, what is the right history right there? Right? If they have different answers, who is the answer that I should take? Right? So that's what this uh, distributed consensus is trying to do. Right? The reason why we call it distributed consensus is because all of these nodes are distributed either geographically or logically. Okay? Logically meaning um, on a network topology point of view, um, you are not centralized or controlled by anyone, so you're sort of distributed uh, all over the place. Okay? So a group of nodes coming to consensus. So just before uh, describing what actually happens, let me introduce some rules, uh, uh, the, the, the rules that people play in Bitcoin. Uh, because compared to the traditional sense where you have a di dictators and the users, the rules are pretty simple. There are only two rules. The one who provides the service and the one who enjoys the service. Okay? The one who provides the services is going to maintain the ledger, decide which to include. The one who, who uh, enjoys the service is going to be, be the one who broadcasts the transaction and just wait until the dictators take this transaction in. Okay? So what happens and uh, what's under the rules in Bitcoin? The first is called a miner. Okay? The miner has basically uh, three, uh, two jobs. Okay? The first thing is that uh, he is the one who maintains the ledger. Okay? He's the one who maintained the ledger. Now, miner is not one person. Anyone can become a miners. Okay? Uh, so if you want to become miners, the duty for you is that you have to maintain this ledger and you have to verify the incoming transaction, whether they have valid signatures from the right from the righteous uh, owner, you know, from the rightful owner. Okay? So uh, that's the first job for miners. The second one is that he is possibly became the block producer, okay? Once you verify that transaction, because anyone can become a, a miner, right? So everyone has a block that he's trying to, he's, he's building. So who gets to propose a new block, right? So son of the lucky dogs um, who, you know, among this miner's pool is gonna be lucky drawn out and then gets to propose a new block, all right? So that's the first rule. Uh, first rule, uh, don't worry if you still have some confusion because we'll be covering um, explain in more detail what they do later on. The next one is full node, okay? Full node is a superset of miners. When you became a full node, you can, you can choose to become a miner or not a miner, okay? Miner or not to miner, basically. Uh, so what full node means, you can just think of it as someone who has all the knowledge. What he do is he's a ledger maintainer. What does that mean is that he has all the data, but he does not mine the next block meaning that he does not do all the work to try to verify the transaction or try to produce the next, next block. He does not do any of that, okay? What he chooses to do is just to have the entire history, have the entire data of the blockchain. Do anyone have any question on that? Can you see why a full, full node is a superset of, of miner? So first of all, you have to choose to become a full node, which you synced up with all the entire history, and you just, right now, you're just maintaining this ledger, and if you want to do a little bit more, you can opt in to become a miner, where you are actively verifying the transaction and trying to find the next block. Okay, great. So the next one uh, is less relevant in our uh, in today's talk. It's going to be a light node. Light nodes are those who are also only a ledger maintainer, but then he has less information. So in a sense, he does not have anything at the bottom, where which I mean by which I mean the Merkle tree. All he has is the actual chain itself. He only have a chain of head blockers. I'm sorry, block headers, sorry. <laughs> he only have a chain of block headers. He does not have anything below, which is the Merkle tree. As I said, that's the most important picture you have in your mind. And you should always visualize when I talk about blockchain, you should always have that, that picture in your mind, okay? So um, anyway, so he only stored the block headers, not the entire block. Entire block meaning all the transaction within that block, okay? so. I'll be explaining later on uh, why do we need like notes uh, in, future, in future episodes. Then the last one is, of course, the users, which is you and me and most people in the network. 
What they do is that they do not have any of the duties that I mentioned above. All they need to do is connect to the network, identify a few full nodes or miners. What they do is just send transaction. I wanna, do, I wanna send this coin to someone. I just broadcast this transaction. I sign it, of course, I have to sign it first. Send it to someone and tell the miners to put it into the next block. Okay, so these are the four uh, roles that we have in Bitcoin. Do anyone have any questions? Okay, great. So, uh, okay, one more point is that when user is trying to know how much he has, what he does it do, because user doesn't keep, a, usually user doesn't keep uh, the entire history of the, of the blockchain, which is pretty probably uh, huge in, in storage. So what they do is you just ask, query the, the, the history and the balance from the full node, because full node has the entire history, as I said. He is the one who's maintaining this ledger. Okay, so now, uh, before we explain, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great, so. Is it, is it, uh, wait. Is it this one? Okay, so the question is, in the Merkle tree, the transaction is included in the Merkle leaf. Is the transaction from, is the transaction from the creation of blockchain? Oh, okay, wait, wait, included in the Merkle is the transaction from the creation of blockchain or the transaction on that block only. Um, okay, so as I said, the transaction is basically have inputs and outputs, right? So um, the inputs is basically something that you haven't spent yet. So what's being included in that particular block is what transaction that happens from the last block to until this point. Does that make sense? Or did I interpret this question correctly? Because I don't, I'm not 100% sure I ain't. Transaction from the creation of the blockchain. Um, or, oh, okay, I think, I think the question is like, how big is the tree? Is the tree, uh, it, because we already have some transaction in the previous block, are we appending new transaction in that tree or are we creating a new tree? I think that's the question. Um, yes, okay, yes, right. So uh, just, just to repeat the question a little bit for those who haven't uh, get the idea. So the question is being, uh, being asked is basically asking whether, because we have a Merkle tree or transaction tree in each block, okay? Are we appending new transaction to the already huge uh, Merkle tree, or are we creating a new one for each block? Okay, so the question, uh, the, the answer is we're creating a new one for each block. Yes, we're creating a new one for each block. Uh, but once again, how you calculate your balances is basically you have to traverse all the way back to calculate all the, 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 transaction, uh, the transaction tree and see which one do you have. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so it's a, it's a new transaction, uh, it's a new transaction tree each, uh, for each block. Great question, that's a great question. Okay, so uh, back to our slides. Uh, for our case, or the Bitcoin case, the peer-to-peer -peer network, who maintained the ledger? Full node maintained the ledger. Once again, full node can be miners or not, okay? Uh, who decides which transaction to include? Any individual miners has the right to, to include partial of the transaction that he hear, he hear from, okay? Um, once again, he definitely hear more than he could include but he has the liberty to choose which to, to, to include from. And this is something that we'll be gonna, gonna be an, uh, analyzed later on in terms of security of Nakamoto consensus and why um, that is the case and that makes sense, okay? Because uh, on the surface, I mean, it doesn't make much sense because you ha if you have a liberty to choose anyone you wanna include, uh, wouldn't that be a chaos, okay? Uh, how do we even agree on that, right? So we'll be analyzing that later on. The next question is who gets to propose the next block? And also the fourth question is who gets to create new coins? And both of these, the answer to both of these questions is gonna be hard working miner, okay? What do I mean by hard working? I'll explain a little bit. But that's the general idea. And we'll, we'll go back to the slides at the end of Nakamoto consensus, okay? Sorry, what? Uh, yes, so hard working mi uh, miners, meaning that not every miner is able to produce the next block. Not every miner is able to print new cash only those who has done some work, okay? So you have to prove your loyalty and dedication and determination. And how do we do that? It's through Lakamoto consensus, which will be explained in detail. What do I mean by hard working, okay? And how hard do you have to work? Okay, so this is a consensus. Don't bother even read the, uh, the slides. I'll go through one line by one line. So there are gonna be five steps 
in terms of reaching a consensus in Bitcoin, okay? So let's take a look at the first one. The first thing that happens in Bitcoin consensus is someone has to want to do a transaction, right? Someone want to update the states of the ledger, otherwise there's no, it's just sit there, doesn't do anything, right? Someone, the new transaction is being broadcasted to all the nodes, um, and pay attention gradually, okay? Well, visually what this says is that, for example, this lazy guy, which is the user who doesn't basically, doesn't do anything at all, all he does is broadcast and tell the rest of you, hey, help me update the states, okay? So what it says is a transaction. The transaction has, like I said, Many, many, many fields. It can include the inputs, which is some UTXO that he owned. I hope at this point, most of you already knew what UTXO is, okay? And then he's referring to uh, in block number 20, index number four, uh, this is the UTXO that's spent to him, that he is able to spend, okay? And he hasn't spent this yet. And the output, for example, if he want to pay to Bob, then he was saying that I'm willing to pay to the Bob address, which is Bob's identity, for example, okay? And then I'm willing to pay him 10 Bitcoin. This is the amount. And also I'm gonna sign this. This is the signature that I verified. This tr transaction actually is signed by me. And, and, and you know, um, so this is the transaction itself. What happens is, first of all, he will connect to some nodes. He, there's no way he can connect to every node in the network. There are literally millions of nodes in the network. There's no way you can connect to so many. So, many. so it's, a, it's a graph where each node has uh, limited edges. Okay, so let's say he only have connection to uh, this lady over here. What he does, once this, let, once this lady hears about his transaction, what she does is that she will initiate a so-called gossip protocol. Okay, gossip protocol by its name, you already knew that he, she's trying to gossip this, or meaning broadcasting or multicasting this transaction, and she tell everyone all the nodes that she connected to, so on and so forth. So she tell some of his friends, and some of the friends will tell the rest of the network. So that's why I said this transaction is being broadcasted to the entire network gradually. Okay? This is very, very important, gradually, because it takes a time, it takes a, 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 a amount of time to reach the entire network. And there are some um, researchers who's, you know, who can, some, even hackers can exploit this. And this is where, um, you know, when we later on refer to the forks, in Bitcoin can happen during this time, and I'll explain a little bit why. So just right now, all you need to remember is that it takes a, a certain amount of time for you, for the, the entire network to know any, any information, okay? So that's the first step. Anyone has any question with the first step? No, okay. So the second step is that the miner is gonna collect all the transactions, because it's not just Alice, the drunk Alice sending the transaction. There are some other, you know, drunk Bob and drunk Charlie, right? Who are, they are all sending transactions. So when miners hear all of these transactions, what he will do, he or she will do, is that she will collect all the transactions, verify each one of them, and then put them into a Merkle tree, calculate the Merkle root, and then put them into the next block, into the next block, okay? So this block right now is only known to him. He's trying to build the next block, meaning that he has to verify everything, put them into the Merkle tree, calculate everything. So that's something, it's called building a block. This is something that, gonna cost him some electricity, you have to run a program on your computer. So it's something you're building, you're mining the next block, okay? So once again, visually, what this miner does, for example, if this miner is this, uh, this miner over here, first of all, uh, remember this guy broadcast a transaction, so he will include everything uh, and, and build this Merkle, Merkle tree, put this Merkle root, trying to produce this block number 11. That's what he did, that's what he does, okay? Anyone with the, anyone has any question with the second one, second step? No, great. So let's move on to the third step. So the third step is that each run, by which I, by which I mean is that each run, so run meaning that um, the time interval between two blocks, the moment from the last block is found till this point, okay? So each run, one random lucky miner will get to propose it's his block, okay? So why do we need this? I wanna explain why before we go, because right now, we don't have any central authority. Now, no one has the absolute say that I should be the one, I'm the miner, okay? Why should I be the one to get to propose a new block? Everyone is validating it. I don't have an absolute say. I'm not the central authority. So we have to have come up a way of a fair lucky draw. So, and this lucky draw has to be random enough so that everyone is willing to join or miners is willing to contribute to verifying the, the, the transaction and, and doing all the work, okay? So this random, this, this process of choosing a random node 
is called proof of work. Okay? The reason why it's called proof of work is because that you have to do some work and you will have a proof that you can convey or convince other people that you've done some work. And once you've done that, other people will accept your block. Okay? Let me explain in a little bit of detail. So the idea is that since there's no central authorities, so what criteria do we based on to choose this random or lucky dog? We have to choose something that no one can centralize or no one can monopolize. So we want something that's non-monopolizable. I'm not sure if it's even a word, but anyway, pretend that there is. So something that you couldn't monopolize and, and these resources is gonna be computational power. So the assumption of the security of the Bitcoin or this Nakamoto consensus is that no one has all the computational power in the world. No one can run all the electricity in the world. So that's kind of the, the idea. So um, when we say proof of work, uh, what kind of work are people doing, are uh, the miner doing, okay? So basically they're trying to solve a computational puzzle. So it's like in your childhood, right? If you have a jigsaw puzzle and you solved it and presented it to your mom, your mom would know you spend some time doing that. So you are spending some resources that is not, res or of course you can ask your brothers or you know, your friends to solve it. But anyway, the idea is that you're trying to solve a puzzle and now we're trying to design a puzzle for the computer to solve. Now, this puzzle cannot be deterministically or quickly calculated. It has to take some time. Otherwise, anyone who runs a program or who, who can just think of an algorithm to solve this puzzle, we're gonna immediately solve it and that's not fair, right? So what we want is something that the computer could not know in advance. He does not know the answer until he finds it. There's no deterministic um, algorithm for you to solve that, that puzzle efficiently. You have to do, um, you know, manually and very, very, like you have to work very, very hard towards that, okay? So the, the exact puzzle is this. Remember there's a nonce in the block headers that we mentioned and we haven't explained what it is, okay? So now the, the, the computational puzzle itself is that you're basically concatenating everything in the block headers. You're concatenating everything in the block headers, all the fields, the previous hash, the timestamp, the, uh, the, the, the transaction Merkle root, plus a nonce and concatenate them together to get a hash. What this nonce is, you can think of it as an incre incremental counter, or you can uh, sometimes in cryptography it's called a salt, right? The, the thing that you actually use in, when you're cooking, the salt or nonce. So what this nonce is, it's just a random number. You can choose it however you want. And how most people are choosing it is like start from any random number and increment it one at a time, okay? So you basically trial and error. I don't know which nonce will give me the right digest I don't know which, because as we said, this is the property that we just reviewed, right? The property of hash function is that I already knew something, the, the result I wanna get, but I don't know the pre-image or the actual original input, okay? So I have to try a lot, many, many, many times until I find the right nuts. okay? Let me explain the difficulty level. Difficulty level means, in Bitcoin case, how many pre, um, how many zeros do you have at the front of this digest? Okay, so as I said, each digest is a hex string. Hex string meaning that each character is, a, uh, is from zero to F, right? It's a hexadecimal you know, character from zero to F. Now, difficulty level means that it has to satisfy some cr criteria, excuse me. The criteria is that the first, for example, 20 bits has to be zero. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say, um, for the sake of discussion, everything from previous hash to until this point is hello world. Okay, let's just assume for the moment. Of course it's not, uh, but now we're trying to find the right nonce. Okay, every time I, I concatenate them together and I do a hash, I'll get a hash digest. This hash digest looks pretty random and there's no way I can you know, deduce. I, there's one witness that we introduce Right? So I have to do uh, time by time, and I, I, I incremented it by one, and I see I find another, another digest, and this digest, digest does not meet or satisfy this difficulty level. Okay, so up until I try to uh, 4,250, until this point, as you can see, the first four digits are all zero. And this is very much by chance, because there's no way I can guess, I knew the first, uh, for example, the difficulty level is saying that as long as you find the, f the first four digits is zero, then you find the right or, or valid puzzle, uh, valid answer. 
But now, by knowing this answer, there's no way I can deduce or have an efficient algorithm for me to calculate what the original text is. And this is by the property of hash function. This is very, very important. Do everyone see the point where there's no way I can have an a, a algorithm to deduce what's, what, what the actual nonce were going to be? It has to, you have to try and error, try and error, until you meet something that you actually find that meets the difficult level. Anyone have any questions? Because this is very important. Don't hesitate to ask, yes. Yes, that's a good question. The question is, it has, is the difficulty level already been set? Okay, so the simple answer is yes. So in the protocol, Bitcoin has a uh, specification saying how difficult it has to be, basically how many digits. So the more, digit, the, the, the more number of digits you have to be zero, the harder it is. Because like every, um, you're basically, you, if you think of a hash function as a random scramble machine, an oracle that you ask every time it gives you outputs a random thing, then you can think of uh, the, prob the probability of you finding the trailing, the trailing uh, zero at, at the front of four zero is gonna be uh, one over 16 times one over 16 times one over 16, right? Because that's the likelihood of the first one being zero, right? So it's very unlikely to have consecutive zero at the front, okay? So uh, once again, this parameter is being set. But with that being said, in Ethereum and Bitcoin, this difficult level is adjustable. Is adjustable. It, it, it means that it depends on the number of hashes that's being produced in this network. So the more people who are trying to find this puzzle, the harder the puzzle should be. Does that make sense? If let's say everyone st 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 uh, suddenly get way smarter than we, we are, and we can do way more calculation in the same amount of time, then the puzzle itself should be harder in order for us to, you know, to keep everyone working. At least you have to prove that you actually done some you know, uh, hard work. Does that make sense? So it's, it's adjustable. And I'll explain in more detail what that adjustable means, okay? Now, uh, first of all, as we already seen, it's really hard to find. You're basically brute force. Brute force meaning that you are trial and erroring and you are just random guessing, okay? And the next one is it is trivial to verify. <laughs> Do everyone understand why it is trivial to verify? Okay, anyone? Yes, so the, the reason why it's trivial to verify is because once you find the right nonce, what you need to do is just tell everyone the nonce as well as the rest of the block headers. So people can just do a hash function and then verify whether you find the right and whether that satisfies the, the difficulty level. That only takes nanoseconds, okay? But to find that, you have to do once and once again in order to find the right nonce, and that takes a very, very long time, okay? And there's no shortcuts. That's the point, okay? If there's shortcut, there's no point at all, okay? So uh, once again, how long does it take in the Bitcoin case to solve this puzzle? On average, it's gonna be 10 minutes. Anyone can explain why on average? Come on, give it a try. Yes, yes, it's probabilities, that's, that's correct. It's because this is not, it's not deterministic or anything. You don't know when will you get or find the next puzzle. There's no way for you to predict because you are asking a random oracle to give you a random number and suddenly this random number satisfies the difficulty level, then you find the right nuts. And then there's no way for you to know how long does it take for you. It's just on average, based on you know, the difficulty level that we set. So as you can see, so this is something, uh, this is the old data already, but right now it should be something similar. Uh, this is something I used last year uh, from blockchain.info. And the time between blocks basically is how long does it take to find the next block, or sometimes called block interval, block interval. It's, it's 10.77 minutes, okay? That's roughly 10 minutes. So the idea is that it's, it's a uh, binomial distribution where the average case is in the middle, where this is 10 minutes. So it is very highly unlikely for you to find the puzzle, highly, highly unlikely for you to find the puzzle in one minute, five, uh, two minutes, three minutes, it's very unlikely. It's also very, very unlikely for you to take one hour to find the puzzle. So on average, when I set the difficulty level, it's roughly, it roughly take you 10 minutes. So if let's say I want to increase the amount of time for you to find the puzzle, what do I do? 
yes, increase the difficulty level, which means that increase the number of digits that are required to be zero, basically, or one, or two, anything, right? As long as you have a fix, uh, like, uh, like a, um, an answer that, you ha that everyone has to fix thing, right? So that's how you do, that's how, why, why we say that it's adjustable. Okay, so the, the reason why is that you, you do not want everyone to take forever to produce the next block, right? At the same time, you do not want anyone who have a lot of computation to just dominate the race and find the next block really, really quickly. And at the start of Bitcoin, there's much less incentive for people to join the network. There are much less, much fewer miners on the network. So the number, the, the computational power is much less or the number of hashes that's being calculated is much fewer at that time. So the difficulty level at that time is lower, but still it takes 10 minutes for them to find. Right now, so many people are mining. Everyone, even in the dorm room of NTU or somewhere else, is trying to mine a network. Even someone is trying to you know, install a malware that's hiding on your web browser to mine on your behalf, and then they will get the reward. So there are so many computational power being, you know, cured into this space. So that's why uh, the, the difficulty level are like increasing, but the, the um, average time for you to find the next block is roughly stays the same. So that's what I mean by adjustable difficulty level. Okay, hope everyone is clear because this is the key part. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very, very good question. So are you asking? That's a very good question. That's a that's a very, very good question. Let me let me repeat the question. So basically, what what Yunwen is she's she's just asking is that um, is everyone starting the nonce? Is everyone starting from zero? If I knew everyone was starting from zero, why not I just start from something that I knew they will end up like they will end up calculating uh, ten to the power of, a, of of three, for example? Then I can just start from there because I would knew someone will explore that space. So the answer, first of all, is that not everyone have the same view of what's being produced with the transaction, okay? So their Merkle root, first of all, is different. Once again, because everyone is hearing about the transaction, they are at a different location of this network. So everyone is hearing some transaction earlier than other people. So the Merkle tree you build is different from other people as well, okay? Even say, okay, so that's, that's why the nonce, even if you start from zero, the actual pre-image or the actual plain text is different from other people, okay? So that's one reason. The second reason, of course, is that can you do a coordinated puzzle finding? Basically, let's say I'm someone, um, I say, okay, right now, blockchain into you, everyone, uh, let's build the same transaction tree and you calculate from zero to 100, you calculate from 101 and to, to 200, everyone gets a space. Can we do it together? Yes, we can do that. And that is called a mining pool. That is basically what Bitman is doing. And Bitman is selling their, their hardware and trying to coordinate people to explore different non-space so that you don't waste your computational power. So there are cases where two people have the exact same Merkle tree same Merkle tree, and they're exploring the same NAS. It's in a sense, one of them is being wasted. The, the, the electricity or you know, the number of hashes they calculate is being wasted because it's being calculated by two people. Yeah. Yes. The, no, so, no, no, wait, that's a very good question. Okay, so the question is, is it correct to say that after 10 minutes is the highest probability that you will calculate the, uh, uh, the, the NAS? The answer is no. It's the network who will produce the block. It might not be you, but it's the network, okay? It can, it can be from somewhere else, okay? So it takes a network an average of 10 minutes to find a block, not a single node. For example, if a single node, you only have 0.0001% of the total computational power, it may take you a thousand years to find a block. But for the network as a whole, we're computing, we're aggregating everyone's computational together, everyone is trying to find its nonce, and it takes on average the entire network 10 minutes 
even if you didn't find it, someone else find it and will tell you the next what the next block is. Okay, that's a very very good question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So that is something that will be covered later on. That's a good question, but keep in mind. Um, so let me let me repeat the question for for the microphone. Um, the question is being asked is what happens if two miners find the same valid puzzles at the same time? As we see, the answers is not singular, right? It's, it's not, there's, there's more than one answers. As long as the first 20 bits, for example, is zero, then it's the right answer. And many people can find many right answers, okay? What happens if two find at the same time? Or well, roughly there's a race, or there's a race condition between these two blocks trying to get become the history, okay? What happens in that case? I'll, I'll, I'll explain later on in that, but that's a, that's a very good question. Um, all right, so as we said, this is what nonce is for. Um, everyone is trying to produce that. Okay, so once you find this nonce, what you do, for example, this guy, find this nonce, this lucky guy, uh, he has a lot of computational power or whatever, then he will tell the rest of his, the, 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 the node that he connected to. He will tell the rest of the network, okay? But of course, this, New block is also being propagated gradually, okay? Now, the fourth one is once this guy find this lucky dog, find this block, and then bro broadcast to the rest of the nodes that he connected to, the rest of the miners will have to verify the proposed block, okay? I have to verify this, you, you find the right solution. What does this verify mean? First is, I have to verify that the transaction of your block, that the included in the, in the block that you proposed to me is all correct. They have the right signatures. Uh, all the UTXO from the input is actually unspent. It's not something that's already been spent. Only in that case, I will accept, okay? That's one thing I have to verify. The second thing is that having this, all of these transactions, what I can do is I can calculate myself, the Merkle root, which is also very simple. It's just a, a bunch of hash. The hash doesn't take any time, right? So very quickly, I'll check whether the Merkle root matches with the block headers that you give me. That's the second thing you will verify. The third thing you will verify, of course, is going to be everything. First of all, you, have, you should have the right previous hash. And this timestamp should be bigger than the previous block. Okay? The third thing is that with this nonce, I concatenate all of them together, hash it, and then it meet the difficulty level. These are the few things that other miners have to verify to make sure that you actually done some work and this block is valid. Maybe just repeat. The validity of all the transactions included is the first thing you have to check. The signatures on all the spending UTXO and also the R actually on spend. The second thing you have to check is the correctness of the Merkle root. Once you have all the transactions, you can calculate that Merkle root. The third one is that the correctness of the previous hash and we have a strictly larger timestamp. The fourth one is the correctness of nonce, which means that it actually uh, satisfied the proof of work. Now, there's more and we'll cover later on what's this more. But for, for, for this part, it's, it's good enough to know that this is something, uh, this is ver verification that all the, other, all the other miners are supposed to do. Okay, now, the last step, the last step uh, for this consensus, uh, Bitcoin consensus is that other miners, they explicitly, explicitly express their acceptance of your block that you proposed by building their next block on top of the proposed block. This is a little bit tricky. And let me explain in detail what do I mean by that. Sorry. So when you broadcast to this, this block, you may think people should give an acknowledgement or refer you back telling you that I'm gonna accept this block. And that is not happening in Bitcoin case. In Bitcoin case, the way they express that they, their acceptance of a block is that they continue building their next block right at the moment that they receive your block, okay? I'll explain why this is secure in a little bit and what happens if he doesn't accept or, or continue building his own block, for example, okay? This is very, very interesting. But for now, just remember, uh, once he wanna accept your block, then he just continue building the next block, which means that he will receive a new transaction, trying to put the, the block with uh, uh, a block height plus one on top of your block, okay? So you may ask, so what is the consensus? At the end of these five steps, it doesn't seem that everyone is like voting or we know like which one is the biggest one. 
or oh, sorry, which one is the, the history, which, which block is legit. And as um, uh, Darren mentioned, that there might be even two valid solutions. Okay, what happens in that case? And in Nakamoto consensus, the longest chain wins. So that is the consensus. And it is a little bit tricky. It's very different from the traditional voting scene where we know explicitly who win the votes, who win the election. Because everyone expressing their vote, everyone can see the result. At that time, people may have different view or different perspective of what the blockchain history is. But to anyone, the longest chain that you hear is the one that you should take as the history. Let me repeat. The longest chain that you know of that some full note tells you should be the one that you take as the right history. Okay? So maybe if you ask different full notes, different full notes will give you different length or different blockchain. For example, in this case, this drunk user is trying to ask this first one. The first one tells you, now I have block until block number 12. And you, as any users, you can verify it very quickly, right? Just like any other miners verify it. It's just that I don't have to verify the transaction itself. All I have to verify is whether this proof of work is actually being solved. Now, if I ask another miners, sorry, excuse me, on the network, she tell me that the, the current block is block number 11, okay? Both of them are correct in a sense that block headers are correct. It's just that this chain is longer. So as a user, how should I take, what, what's the consensus that I should take for the network is that I think this is gonna be the history. This is the chain that I take. So remember, longest chain wins, longest chain wins. And I'll explain why that's secure uh, in our analysis later on, okay? Anyone has any question? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So if you are if you want to be in the middle between the so the speed of traffic or the most common like Very good question. Let me repeat the question. The question is <clears throat> as I said, you have different nodes may have different view or different length of the blockchain. So does that mean that I have to ask literally millions of miners to get to know the actual history? The answer is no. Because um, when you when someone finds a block, he's broadcasting that to the rest of the network. Although it takes a while for the block to reach the rest of the network, it only takes roughly, let's say, 10, 10 seconds to 20 seconds. I think, I think it's like 15 seconds uh, by some of the research. I'm not exactly sure, but that's roughly how long does it take. So when someone, the rest of the network, receive a valid block, what they're supposed to do is include that into the chain that they're building, their local view. So when someone asks them, they should tell them, this is the current block. Right? In a sense, you don't have to ask everyone. You can ask one or two, wait a minute, wait, wait a few seconds, and everyone should be sort of up to date, should be synchronized. Does that make sense? Anyone understand the question and the answer? Yes, so once you hear, okay, so let's say you are offline for a while, let's say, and you didn't hear from the rest of the network, okay? So your, your chain stop at block 10, but then when you reconnect to the network and you hear from someone else who gives you, right now we're, we're already at block 20, okay? You don't know what's happening between them, but at the same time, you can verify that any block in between is valid. So what you do is that um, once you hear someone who has a longer chain than you do, you just accept the longest chain that you hear about. Does that answer your question? Or you have a slightly different question? So is there a lot of, uh, for example, how, oh, okay, so, oh, sorry. The question is basically asking uh, how long, how exactly how long do I have to wait? It's, it depends, right, on the person who decides to answer. Uh, okay, so I'll be introducing another notion of confirmation time, basically, how long does it confirm? Uh, later on, but that's a good question. Keep in mind, everyone keep in mind. That's a, that's a good question. Let me repeat the question, okay? So how long can one be sure or confident or confirm that something is already becoming the history? That I will, you know, this is the canonical chain in the sense that this is the, the chain that everyone should agree on. How long does it take for me to confirm that? Okay, That's called confirmation block and we'll, we'll, we'll introduce later on, all right? So up until this point, I hope all the, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No. 
So first of all, for you to become to have an identity on Bitcoin is permissionless, meaning you can do as many as you want. For you to become a miners or full node, all you need to do is just sync up with the rest of the network. So that also is permissionless. In a sense, you can have as many miners as possible, as you can, as you wish, basically. So there's no limits on how many miners or how many uh, full nodes that you want uh, on the network. Yeah. Okay. So Nakamoto consensus. First of all, this guy really is, his name is Nakamoto consensus. Oh, sorry, Nak uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> sorry, my bad. <clears throat> I was drunk. I was the drunk user. Um, so his name is really uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And the funny thing is, after Bitcoin become, became famous, he has to testify in court saying that, hey guys, my name is Satoshi Nakamoto, but I'm not the inventor of Bitcoin. I am not. Please stop sending me emails. Please stop you know, sending me mails to my, to my home address. So it's, it's a super funny game. But here we are. Since we don't know the actual identities, the true identity of who Sat Satoshi Nakamoto is, um, let's take it as it is. So Nakamoto consensus is basically two things, proof of work and the longest chain wins, basically the, uh, the consensus itself. What do we agree on? And the process through which we get to this consensus. Proof of work is the process. The results or the consensus agreement is that the longest chain win. Okay? And the longest chain sometimes is called the canonical chain. Okay? Canonical chain. It's just a term that most people use uh, either in paper, in blog post, that you know so that you, you have an idea. Great. So now let's dive into the analysis. <clears throat> First of all, why decentralized? Why? People say that Bitcoin protocol is decentralized. So first of all, like we already told, or like people, the question that you ask, everyone can compete. Every miner can join this, this race, this fanatic race of finding the right solution to the computational puzzle. And everyone has a, probabilistic, has a prob probability of becoming the lucky dog. It's not deterministically saying that you know you will definitely be the one, and there's no central authority. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why it is decentralized. Okay, so um, as I said, if you are the first one to serve to to solve the puzzle, and you are the first one to broadcast your answer, it is highly highly likely that your answer is going to end up in the history. Okay, if you are the second one, then it's less likely. The reason why is because the first one already told. Some of his members, so some of his connected nodes. So some people already start building the next block on top of that. So you have a less chance of get, getting accepted. So the first nodes usually, the first one who solved the puzzle is usually the one who can, uh, who, whose block is going to get accepted. Okay. So once again, every every miner can compete, and then pro probably they, they have they, they probabilistically became the first node, uh, first to solve the puzzle. The second one is, can anyone dominate? the proof of work race. Okay. In order to dominate it, what do you need? You need a lot of computational resource. You need to do a lot of hashes really, really quickly, quicker than the rest of the network. That's how you're going to dominate the race. So is that possible? Let's take a, take a look at the stats. This is not from the beginning of the Bitcoin. This is from only a couple of months back. And this is how many, the number of hashes be, being calculated per second. Okay, so I don't think anyone can see the number there. So I just find, as of I think uh, two or three months back, uh, the hash rate, meaning the number of hash that the network is able to calculate, is I don't know. I don't even know the numerical. How do I pronounce? So uh, gigabyte of uh, gh, meaning a million hashes per second. So you have. A million, no, a billion of a million hashes per second. That's how much. Sorry, no, it's like more than that. So basically, I don't even know like how do you, <laughs> what's the order of magnitude there? Uh, apology for my English, but anyway. <clears throat> so that is how hard it is. There's no way, even if you are NSA, I mean, theoretically, if you're a Bitman and you have a lot of hardware under your control, uh, you might have, you might enjoy a huge pool or at least huge portion of the computational power out there. Uh, but still, it's really hard to dominate any so so many hashes, right? You can only, you know, you're just a small pie over there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> speaking of this, the next natural question is: since it is so hard to find the next puzzles, what are some incentives? Why people are spending so much money, so many electricity, so much electricity, 
and spending my hardware, my CPU, I even buying new computers or even new server GPU to do this, you know, a Bitcoin mining, trying to find the next block. So what are some of the incentives for the miners to do this work? Okay. That's the natural question that we ask, right? Since we, we saw it's so hard and takes so many work. The first is block reward. What block reward is basically saying, once you find the next block, you should get rewarded. Why? Because you've done some work. You've done some good work to the communities. Okay, what you do is that the Bitcoin protocol allows the miner, the one who mined the block, to include one corn creation transaction into that new block that you find. Okay, once again. So when you are hearing a lot of transaction, you're trying to produce the, the, the next block, what you do on top of including other people's transaction, you will include one transaction of your own. And this transaction is called coin creation transaction. What does that mean? You're minting Bitcoin out of thin air. And why do everyone agree that you can get this, this, this Bitcoin sort of like for free? Essentially, you're not doing it for free because you, you are spending a lot of electricity on this. Okay? It's because people will agree that you've done some work and that deserves some reward. Okay? So that's the block reward, which is one of the biggest uh, incentive for most of the miners who are trying to mine. So then we go back to the fourth step where I said there's many more that other people should verify. And there's one item more right now, which is you have to verify the guy has included a corn creation, the right corn creation transaction into that block. Meaning that he could not create more than he should. He could not create less. Of course, I don't think if he create less, actually, I don't know like, what would happen. But like from the miner doesn't have the incentive to give yourself less money, right? So I, I don't think that would ever happen. But the idea is that other people will verify that you are not, you know, allocating more uh, Bitcoin to yourself out of thin air. Okay. So how much do I get exactly? Uh, right now, at this point of time, uh, if you find the next block, you are getting 12.5 Bitcoin per block you find. So imagine a few months back when Bitcoin is almost 10,000 USD per Bitcoin, you can get become millionaire just to find two or three blocks. That's how filthy those miners could get, filthy rich, you know? Uh, now, the thing is, uh, this block reward is getting halves every, you know, uh, this number of blocks. So after some time, roughly, I think two years, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long does it take. So like 10 minutes times this and calculate how long does it take. Um, that's basically how long you will have. Basically, as it starts, when Bitcoin was created, I think it awards 15 Bitcoin, 50, 50, 15 Bitcoin per block that you find. Later on, it halves to 25. Right now, it's already been halved to uh, 12.5. Later on, it will be halved and all the way. So as you can see, at the end of the day, there's going to be a cap, a supply cap, because the block reward is being reduced or halved every other th this many block, right? So the total supply, there's a cap, it's, which, which is 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, if you ask why, I don't know. Uh, it's just the design of Satoshi Nakamoto. It doesn't have any, I don't, I don't think they have like any um, economic study on how much coin should you create, right? Because they do, know, they do not even know how much coin, each, each one of these coins is gonna worth. You don't know, it's just, it's just a number, right? But this supply is steady. So um, like I said, oh, okay. So w w another thing is that uh, this, by year of 2040, uh, the Bitcoin is gonna have no, long, there's no more uh, Bitcoin or very negligible uh, block reward anymore. So you may ask, until that point, wouldn't everyone stop mining since I don't have the block reward? Which introduced us to the second incentive for the miners to continue doing the work and maintaining the ledger, which is transaction fee, okay? Transaction fee basically is saying that anyone who wanna do a transaction, who wanna update the states of the Bitcoin network, you should pay the miners some fee because you're sort of enjoying, enjoying this kind of service. It's like when you're doing transaction in the bank, the bank also charge you some certain transaction fee, right? Sometimes it can be small, you know, sometimes if you have enough uh, bank accounts, uh, sorry, uh, uh, bank balance, it doesn't even charge you. But the idea is that they still sort of charge you some management fee, for example. Those are the fees that you are paying for the Bitcoin miners, right? That makes sense, right? Because uh, the way that you should think about it is that you, the ledger maintenance as a service, 
you should think whenever someone process your transaction, they're basically essentially helping you maintain this ledger. And that is a service that they, they provide. The entire network provides for you. And you should pay for that. How do you pay for that? The, the idea is that um, you should specify an output that's slightly um, less than the input. Okay? So let's say I want to spend, I have 10 Bitcoin as an input, and I want to spend um, $9 to Bob. So the rest, one Bitcoin that I didn't specify, by default, goes to the miner. Okay? Anyone who pick up this transaction is able to, is, is able to collect this one Bitcoin. Okay, so this is gonna be the UTXO for the miners. Later on, he can spend. All right. So um, as you can see, this transaction fee can be uh, determined by you. If you are, you know, someone who is kind of uh, not willing to spend any, who, who is like compla complaining about tax taxation already, he doesn't want to pay more on the uh, Bitcoin transaction. I just say, I just give you, I don't know, uh, only one thousandth of the, uh, the, the money that I do, trans the transaction amount, then it's very likely that the miners do not include your transaction. If you stand in from the miner's pr perspective, he hears so many transactions. Which one should I take? Of course, I would take the one who gives me the most money. I'll take the one who has the, mo the highest transaction fee. So that's the strategy that most uh, Bitcoin miners are taking. Okay? The more money you give me, the more willing I am to include that. So the, the higher priority that you have. Okay? That's one of the priority that, that, that gives to different transactions. But there's another uh, which should use later on. But that's the idea. These are the two incentives in the Bitcoin. And this is very important. This is why miners are willing to spend their, their money and their time and their electricity to maintain this ledger. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 So the the question is, even if the the number of Bitcoin that's being rewarded in the block reward is having like every other so many blocks. Uh, the value of each coin itself is never specified, and you never know. It's determined by the market how willing people are in paying this this, this Bitcoin, and that is correct. If, even if, let's say, uh, after a few, uh, two years, uh, we are reduced back to six point two five Bitcoin, um, that might even worth more than what we have right now with twelve point five Bitcoin. That is correct. You 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 do, you do not know like how much does will that uh, cost. And at the same time, it's not an inflating system like most of the, uh, I don't know, monetary system that we have uh, under government where people or China is just basically printing a lot of money uh, and the inflation just go through the roof. Um, but then in this case, you have limited and control stream of income or inflow of m money supply, right? So in a sense, people have an expectation of how much money is being printed instead of in, in the you know, Chinese government case, it's pretty opaque. You, don't, you do not know, you know how much, and it takes a long time for the market to react to the, the new cash that's being poured into the market, right? So, but in, in this case, uh, if, because people already have an expectation that the block reward is gonna, is gonna reduce, then I knew that um, the supply is gonna, you know, the, the, the growth of the supply is gonna reduce, and then probably people will value each coin more. That's very likely, that's very likely, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so the question is, if number of zero at the front of in, uh, indicates the difficulty level, um, can someone who starts with nine zero gets a better chance in getting the right to announce the block? Okay, so that's a good question. So the question basically, uh, as I interpret it, is that um, instead of finding the exact right answer, can I find something that's close enough? Good attempt, great attempt. It's just that it's not, unfortunately, it's not the right, it's not a legit answer. Can you get rewarded by that? Or do you have a chance to broadcast even your solution to the rest of the network, okay? Because you're already spending a lot of time to find the, the to make sure that the, the first night block is zero. I already spent some money. I already spent a lot of electricity and work, do done a lot of work to get that. But it's just that I didn't find the first 10 zero, that's all, okay? Should I get rewarded? So the answer is yes and no. In Bitcoin protocol, it does not reward you that. But in reality, you could. 
the way you do it is to join a mining pool, okay? Just be exactly because of the re because of this reason, where people feel like this very high, highly unlikely for me to find the right hashes with ten trillion, uh, the, the first ten digits being zero. But it's okay for me to find the first two digits, for example. But I still did, did some work. I should be rewarded by that. So when people join a mining pool, what the mining pool is basically doing is that I encourage everyone to um, to do a lot of hashes for me. And if someone finds a, a close enough answer, I will still give you portion of the block reward if we find one. Okay. So at least I, I'll give you. So your return on investment, the variance of the your ROI is going to be uh, less. So it's not going to be impossible for you to find anything. You still get something in return. So that's one of the reasons people are willing to join mining pool. Do I answer? Yeah, please. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the uh, first thing first is that um, I think you still are some missing steps um, in terms of understanding the hash function itself. It's like even if you find, so the distance for you to find, um, uh, already find nine, nine trillion, uh, sorry, uh, nine zero at the front and 10 zero at the front, these are two independent cases. These are two independent events. It doesn't mean that it's an incremental work that you need to do to find the 10th the to be zero. It means that you, it has to take very, very still. So every every attempt is a new attempt. It does not add up. It's just not. It's, it's not like you know. Okay, I already found the, the first zero to uh, the first nine zero to uh, the first nine digit to be zero, uh, and then I start working the rest. There's no. There's no. Uh, no such thing. So every time we are trying to produce a hash digest, it's a it's a new thing because you're changing the pre image of the hash function. Is do, did I interpret that question correctly? Because. Do, and then do I do I answer that uh, maybe okay? Yeah okay. So maybe maybe let me let me paraphrase paraphrase this a little bit. Um, it, it it means that regardless of what answer that you find previously, it does not affect the probability of you finding the right answer next time. Okay, so it's like a Markov chain, but you know, not really. Uh, it, it's like every time we are trying to find the the, the difficulty, uh, trying to find the solution to the uh, proof of work puzzle. Uh, does not matter how much you already done. How much, how how likely you are able to find is just, you know, the probability of you finding. It's just that the longer, the longer, um, the more time you have to compute iteratively and try a lot of counters, the more likely you will get. Okay. Sorry, what? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so um, the, the way that you solve, the only possibility for you to accelerate the puzzle solution finding process is to have, to calculate more hashes per, per unit time. That's the only way, okay? So you have to calculate a lot of, a lot of hashes to find that. So, um, and the more you do, it's like every time you, you, you did something, you do the nonce, you're eliminating that from the possibility of solution. So every time you're eliminating one, eliminating one, um, and uh, the, the, the way that you can accelerate the process is just that eliminate it faster, that's all. So the more hashes you do, the quicker you can find. Um, and the, the, the longer time you do, the more elimination you, you thought. So you, you know like these nonce doesn't, that wasn't the, the, the solution. And then um, the more likely you will get uh, later on. So that, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the question. If you have any questions, I think uh, we can answer offline later on. All right, so let's go back to our analysis. <clears throat> let's go back to our analysis. So we already solved, okay, why decentralize um, these two? And now let's move on to the second point, which is more important. Why would the network even agree with the Bitcoin or the, the consensus that we have, the consensus protocol we have? First of all, what happens to the transaction that wasn't included in the block that's being produced, right? As I said, there are so many transactions out there and there are only a few being included, right? What happens to the rest? 
Okay. So the answer is, first of all, if you have a higher transaction fee, you're more likely to get in included because that's the incentive for the miners to include you first. So you have a priority. The second priority that you have is that uh, the second priority that certain transactions have is that the longer you wait, the higher priority that you have. Okay. This is something specified in the Bitcoin protocol. In a sense, it's like seniority kind of thing. The more senior you are, the more likely you will get into the next block. Okay. Um, even if you didn't pick up, someone else might pick up. So when certain transaction is being heard by some uh, miners, the miner will first of all verify that this transaction is true. Once he verify that, he will put that into a main pool. Main pool meaning memory pool. Okay, the main pool is something that you will see over recursively over and over again if you read some Bitcoin Wikipedia page. Okay, main pool meaning that a pool of thing that the, the miner is keeping in his memory space that he already verified, but hasn't, may or may not be included into the block yet. Okay? So every time when a block is being found, the, the transaction that still remains in the memory pool will have like plus one, at one on their age. So their age, the, num the, the number of blocks that already stay in the memory pool will plus one, in a sense that seniority just increased by one. So even if some new, if let's say, uh, both of these transactions have the same uh, transaction fee, so it's the same incentive for the miners to include. Now, the miners, supposedly, uh, specified by the protocol, is supposed to pick up the more senior one. Okay? That's how even if you did not get included into this block, it's very likely that in a two or three blocks, you will get included. Okay? So sen senior block have a higher a priority. So the next question, of course, is transaction that I didn't even hear about. Okay? The transaction has never been pro propagated to, to certain miners. For example, I'm in, I don't know, North Korea, who, um, that, that, that my network is pretty, pretty terrible, and um, I don't get to connect to a lot of nodes. I only connect to a few nodes, right? Um, now, what happens is that, and it takes a, forever for, uh, from some, some transaction in the United States to North Korea, for example, right? So what happens if some transaction I didn't, as a miner, I didn't hear about? So the idea is that once you hear about a block, the first thing you do, the, the, the miner will have to uh, tell you all the transactions is included in this block. So you will have to verify all the transaction. Okay? Even if you do not hear about them previously, once you receive that block, you can, you can verify that, that transaction. Okay? Does that make sense? Right, so you can verify that transaction and then uh, make that block as, as their history and start building on, on top of that. Okay? It doesn't have to be something you originally hear, but as long as the block is proposed to you, you can verify all the transactions within it. Okay. Now, the next question is, will it happen if some invalid block gets accepted? If let's say I find something, I produce a Merkle root that is fraudulent, or I include a transaction that actually is wrong, doesn't have a, signature, a valid signature, or I create, as a miner, I create more than I deserve in the Merkle tree, in the transaction tree. What happens if an invalid block gets created the, of course, the answer to this is once you did that, um, we're assuming that most people are honest, most of the miners are honest, then most of them would not accept your block because there's no incentive for them to accept an invalid block, okay? Of course, if you are trying to do some malicious thing, let's say I'm trying to give myself more money or I create coin out of thin air to myself and we are a cartel, for example, we have a lot of uh, miners in the network, and all of the networks we already tell each other, you know, include this invalid transaction. Now, the assumption is you are not a majority, okay? Unless you can persuade the entire network that this invalid transaction block is the history, then you could, um, only in that case, will this invalid transaction be in part of the history. And any other cases wouldn't be, okay? So in the sense that only if you are a bad guy and you control the majority of the network, that's the only case where you can include an invalid transaction into the block. Otherwise, the rest of the, the, rest of the um, network would not accept that, okay? Because they do not have any incentive to, to include this invalid block. It does not do any good to them. And plus, if let's say, uh, very, very interesting, this is where crypto economics comes in because everyone has a strategy of choosing, let's say, if I'm someone who hear from an invalid, who I, I listen, I, I knew there's an invalid block broadcast to me, okay? And although this invalid transaction does, has nothing to do with my interest, I still include this. I start building on top of this block, right? The way, the way I express my accept, acceptance is by implicitly building on top of this block, okay? So what happens is, 
it's very likely that the majority of the network would not accept this block. Meaning that they are actually building on top of some other blocks. Meaning that my electricity or my time that I spend on building this block on top of this invalid block is gonna be wasted. I will not be accepted by the majority network. And if my block does not accept by the majority network, it means that I do not get the block reward. I do not get the transaction fees. So that's where the crypto economics comes in, where I have the incentives to build on top of valid blocks because that I am assuming the rest of the block, the rest of the network would do so as well. Okay. So if I build on an invalid block, I would, I would not, in, at the end of the day, after a few blocks, I will find out I'm not the longest chain because most people wouldn't build on that. Okay. So that's where crypto economics com comes in. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So uh, you said seniority also to do So seniority is the time that you have to do DD. Yes. So if you know I have a lesser type of thing, mm -hmm. then the person who is the newer is going to go. Yeah. If I wait for long enough to do Yeah. So um so you're asking how do you compare the weight of seniority and the transaction fee? Yes. So, uh, so I think uh, one example, of course, is that let's say uh, you are pretty, your transaction is pretty senior, meaning that you already wait for one hour, but you, it never get accepted uh, because the transaction fee that you pay is just too too small. Uh, the answer is yes. It's possible for you for you that uh, there's no miners who's willing to pick up your transaction. That's possible. But at the same time, what you can do is if you are a miner yourself, you can include your transaction. Even if it does not pay much to yourself, you just want to create, you just want to include your own transaction. Does that make sense? And you can create your own coin and other people doesn't care how much transaction fee people pay you. Once you create the, new, the next block that is valid, people will include that transaction anyway. So if you are only a user, it is possible. And if you are thrifty and you do not, you are not willing to pay a lot of transaction or standard transaction fee, then it's likely that, for example, you pay zero transaction fee. It's, it's, it's likely that your transaction is going to be floating around in the network forever. No one is going to pick it up. <laughs> even if it's a valid transaction, even if you have a very high signality, people just do not have the incentive to pick it up unless you are the miner itself. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Which is the next block? Yes. So first of all, when you build the next next block, you will broadcast to any, any, everyone else. Okay. So um, as someone who is still working on the current block, if I hear someone who already broadcast to broadcast to me a new block, the protocol specified that I should immediately drop down the current work that I'm doing and build on the, the this block, this new block. Once I verify this new block is correct. Okay. So uh, in a sense, there is no way for you. At any, so if we take a snapshot in time and, and, and at that time, everyone freezes and I ask every node, what's the uh, chain you think currently is? Everyone will give you, probably gives you a different answer. I mean, at least there are probably three or four different uh, candidates that someone haven't heard of the new block yet. Someone, even if he hear, he hear it, he's not willing to accept the new block because he's so con persistent. He want to find a new block by himself. That's also possible. But once again, when you hear a new block, the assumption is you probably would assume that the rest of the network also hear about this new block. So most people are already building on their next top. They're already dedicating their computational power to find the block plus one, the high plus one, while you are still, you know, if you're trying to, to overrun this one, it's, it's, it's very hard because you are competing with the rest of the network. The rest of the network already accept this block from your point of view, it's very likely, right? So it's not in your best interest to uh, continue doing your, the, the, the work on that on the current block. Does that make sense? Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So uh, the question is like, um, if you receive a new block, are you supposed to drop everything you're doing? The, the answer is yes. Uh, let me explain once again why you should drop the, the, uh, the, the, everything you're doing. 
So if let's say you do not drop everything you do, even if you receive a new block, okay, you still trying to find the block of the same height, okay? But at, the, at that time, when you hear from someone else, it means that this guy is broadcasting to the rest of the network. It means that the rest of the network probably already hear about this block already. Meaning that most of them are probably already start building the next, next block. You see what I'm saying? The next block on top of this new block. Okay. If you're still trying to find this one, it's really hard for you to become the longest chain because there's only limited amount of computational power you have to compete with the rest of the one, the rest of the network who is already building the longer chain. Does that make sense? So you do not have the incentive to continue building your own unless you have a huge portion of computational power. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll probably go back to that question a little bit later um, and a little bit more because that's a, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So you see that for example, there's there's a really cool new subject or something. Mm -hmm. And the one who takes the height of B gets the point of this one. Yes. So for let's say miners, yeah. when we pick up that connection, it becomes very hard. Yes. Transaction fee. Uh, a, a, a fee right? Yes. So there's a lot of people who want to be the one with the highest fee. Yes. Okay. So there's a lot of competition to be who's the first one. Yes. And let's say there's you know such a low uh, fee. Yeah. But there's always a block in the wall. Yes. And then so that you know this guy will be floating around. Yeah. Just to pick it up and you finish it very fast to the wall. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, let, let me, let me just address that question. So he's basically asking that, um, once, even if you're not getting transaction fee from that transaction, you still are getting a block reward. Why not just pick it up? Right. Why not? It's just, is, is that a question? Yeah, it's just like no, one is doing it. no one is doing it. Why not? Okay. So the answer is right now in Bitcoin, every block has a limit, has a block size upper bound, meaning number of transactions you include in each block is capped. So if you take some transaction that does not give you transaction, transaction fee, then you're missing out some transaction fee, basically. Once again, right now in Bitcoin, so this is something I missed, I should mention, okay? This is something I missed. Right now in Bitcoin, the size of the block is fixed, is capped. You should not go bigger than one megabytes, okay? Uh, Bitcoin Cash basically extended that to a bit more, a, a bit larger block size, okay? So the block size is fixed, meaning that the number of transaction you can include is fixed. Does that make sense? No, okay, okay. okay. So if you can, um, you can build a huge Merkle tree, include a lot of transaction, even if some transaction doesn't pay you any transaction fee, you could, but if you do so, it's an opportunity cost. If you include something that um, didn't pay you transaction fee, you are missing out something that someone can that actually pay you transaction fee. And there's only limited amount of transaction that you can include in each block. There's a cap of number of transactions you, you want to pay. So from your pers pers perspective, um, it's in your best interest. Your incentive is just to pick the one that, that pay you the most. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the the amount of competition there is so high. Yeah. You know, most of the time, yeah. You're just wasting your own. That's right. But once you get it, once you get it, it's a lump sum of money. Once you once you get my, uh, get to mine the next block, you became a lucky dog because once you're doing it, you have a probability of like you will knew how how likely you will get uh, to mine the next block. It's a lucky draw, right? Because the more computational power you have, the more likely you will get to be lucky draw, right? Um, and um. So when you get this, it's like, it's like gambling where you will know at the end of the day, you probably will get a lump sum once if you do, you continue doing this. So you have to calculate the expected cost and expected return, right? Most of the time you're wasting money, but if you mine the next block, you get huge block reward. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to calculate it. So, um, if you watch Silicon Valley, which is the, the TV show, um, there's one funny episodes where a uh, Gail Foy, which is one of the uh, character in that, in that TV series. <coughs> he has this alarm, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so he has this alarm on his computer. Once the Bitcoin price go below a certain price, um, it will give him an alert saying that it's no longer uh, profitable to mine in the sense that the expected return 
is le less than expected uh, the cost of your electricity and everything. So it is true. You have to calculate that yourself. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so <clears throat> the next one is that uh, what happens if we have multiple valid solutions around at the same time, which is something Darren's asked, okay? This is a huge one. And this leads to one of the attacks that we may have on Nakamoto consensus. And I want to explain this really well. So um, I know this is going to be a little bit exhausting since we have a quite long session, but this is important. So please pay attention, okay? So what happens is that uh, the attack itself is that I want to do a chain reversion. I want to revert the chain. In a sense, I want to go back in history, change the history. How do I do that? First of all, let's say, <clears throat> in a scenario, we'll give an example. Let's say I, um, someone on eBay or on Alibaba is willing to accept me paying in Bitcoin, okay? So I pay for some commodity. Now, I pay, transact I, I pay in Bitcoin, and I wait the transaction to be included, okay? Let's say this transaction is being included by some miners, Okay? And this miners tells me, because as a user, I can ask the miners, what's the latest block? Now, this miners already produced this block, and he already broadcast to some partial of the network. Now, um, I, I already seen, and then these, um, uh, and then I present this block to the merchant, saying that, see, my transaction to you, my transaction, which gives my money to you, already included in the block. Please accept this payment and give me the goods. Okay? Give me the commodity. So what happens is that, um, now, me, at the same time, while I present this green block to the to the merchant, at the same time, I secretly build trying to build another block, which is the red block, on my own. And in this block, I do not have the payment transaction. Okay? Which means that in this in this part of the history, I did not actually pay him. Now, I didn't tell anyone, I just secretly building on my own. As, let's say I have a lot of computational power and I try to build on my, on my own. Now, once the commodity is being delivered to me, which means that the merchant is, is convinced because he, he already seen the, the next the, the, the block, which is the longest at that time from his point of view, because he doesn't know the red block yet. So for him, this is the longest chain. This is probably the history, right? So uh, he will accept it. But then let's say I am very, very lucky, or I have a lot of computational power, and luckily I find a chain around at the same time, and I broadcast it. This, this red long, uh, th th this, this, this chain. And then this is a com competition between the red and the green. Now, if let's say I have a better connectivity with the rest of the network, then most of the network will hear about my red block first. So it's likely for them to take me as the first one to solve the problem and then take the red block um, as, as the history or as the canonical chain. In a sense, I'm reverting the history. Does that make sense? Does the scenario clear enough? Is the scenario clear enough? So this case, you have to find the chain that is reversed. Yes. So right now, first of all, okay, right now, we are uh, still having two competing chain that because every block, it takes time for the rest of, to, to propagate the rest of the network. Even if people hear like two blocks, he does not, both of them are valid. So you have to randomly choose which one to, to build on. So all I'm saying is that I have a chance of getting my red block, my, my malicious block, Accepted. I have a chance if I quick enough. I'm I'm good enough to find the the, the block, red block fast enough before the, the, anyone who find the next block. You know, traveling this this red this red green block. Oh, sorry, this this green block. Yeah. If I'm good enough, you know, I can do that. Now then, history is reverted. Okay. No, uh, find faster meaning solve the proof of, proof of work puzzle faster. Verify takes no time at all, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you could do that. Yes, yes. The assumption is. The, 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 the right, that is, that is correct, yes, yes. But um, as we will see, as this, see, this is a, seems to be a very legitimate attack, uh, but the assumption, of course, is that it's very likely for you, again, you against the world. It's the mining pool against the world. The rest of the world is trying to find this block, the, the, the successor of this block, this green block, okay? Because 
you, you, you have to present this green block to the merchant first so that merchant is convinced that his transac the transaction is being included. So in a sense, this green block has to be produced first. But then what you are counting on is that you can build it faster than the, than the green block so that you can build it faster uh, than the rest of the network to build a longer chain. Okay, that's the idea of how can you revert the history. Okay. Uh, do not please do not care about the, 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 the this part. Okay. Uh, all I'm saying is that um, as a malicious one, you have a even have a higher probability of getting producing the longest chain, the rest of the network. In that scenario, you could revert the history. Okay. Now, this attack sometimes. So the question, of course, is how likely is this attack going to succeed? If it's very likely, then we're all doomed. Why are we even talking about Bitcoin? It's like, should be hacked any minute, any minutes, right? So um, in a sense, as I probably already hinted, the only way for you to do such attack, successfully launch such attack, is that you have to be able to find a valid block faster than the rest of the network. What that means is that you have to have more computational power than the rest of the network then probabilistically you will end it up with a longer chain than the rest of the network because the rest of the network is supposedly building on this one and you're secretly building on on this malicious red chain yourself okay unless you can do it faster better you know more lucky luckier than the rest of the network then there's no way so that's in sense in, in a sense it's called 51 percent attack if you have compute 51 percent or even more computational power of the network mean that you knew probabilistically you should have a higher chance of getting the next block than the rest of the network combined. That's when you have a dominant say, or you know, even it's very dangerous for you, you, you it's possible for you to revert the chain. Next, uh, next question. Yeah, go ahead. Is it this one? Is it this one? Okay. Uh, so the question is, suppose the current transaction pool has a number of transactions, how do multiple miners, okay, uh, repo, uh, typo, reach an agreement on which is the next transaction to verify? Uh, as I said, the, the transaction pool has a lot of transaction and all of them, okay, which one to verify? You can verify anyone you want. It's just that when you include, verify itself, it's really quick, it's really fast. It's just doing the verify function in the DSA which takes only nanoseconds. So you can choose, you can, you can verify ev everything in just one, under one microseconds. Um, so it doesn't have to, you don't have to care about that. All you have to care about is which transaction to include. And that's a legitimate question. Okay. Okay. okay, so the question is who de determined the difficulty of the nouns? Uh, as I said, it's, it's being specified in the protocol itself and it's being adjusted by the protocol itself as well. Okay, so what, what do I mean by that? So at first, when Bitcoin started to come about, um, the protocol, meaning that the, the, the actual program that everyone is running, has a default parameters on how hard that thing could be or the difficulty level of the proof of work solution. That's as a start. As I said, it's adjustable. It's automatically based on how many hashes has been calculated. So if let's say um, within the next day, I find out that people find the puzzles faster than I expected which means on average, people only take eight minutes to find the puzzle. What I, so as a protocol itself, because you, there's a timestamp in every block headers, so you'll see how long does it take to find the next block, right? So as a protocol itself, as a network itself, you will know that very likely some more computational power has already joined the pool to reduce this average time or average block, block interval. And that's when uh, the protocol itself, everyone should agree that we are um, increasing the difficulty level. So it's like automatically adjustment uh, by, by the uh, consensus itself. So let's say um, after one day, so there's a, there's a period of time that is fixed. So after this period of time, people will look on the, the past, for example, 100 block, and then calculate the difficulty level for the next 100 blocks. So if, if let's say for the next 100 blocks, you are still trying to propose a block that only satisfy the difficulty level of the last epoch, the last period, then no one will accept your block because they do not agree on you finding the right proof of work um, puzzle. But that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. There's one more solution. Uh, okay, so this is the question. Question is, where is the mempool stored in the blockchain? Mempool is never on the blockchain. Mempool is in your local machine. Mempool is 
something that a miner store in your local machine. Meaning that, first of all, your machine is connected to the network. When someone sends you a transaction, this transaction hasn't been, it's not part of the blockchain at all because you haven't proposed a block yet. So you have to verify that. Once you verify that, it was in your, your, your memory space. So it's, in your, it's only local to your view. You have the liberty to take some of those and try to build the next block. And only when you propagate and broadcast this block will the rest of the network hear about this transaction. Otherwise, they might not even know whether you knew this transaction or not, or whether you verified this transaction or not. Does that answer your question? So the trans mempool is not on blockchain at all. Mempool is not. The only thing that's being on blockchain is something that has, the transaction has already been verified and a, a block that has the right proof of work um, uh, solution. But that's a good question. Okay, so let's go on. Next one is chain fork rule. So in a sense, uh, I want to introduce two very, very important uh, terminologies. This is very important, okay? So the first one is called forks. You've seen this a lot of the times, uh, either on the news, seeing Bitcoin Cash is a fork, is a hard fork. Uh, you probably doesn't know what it means. Essentially, what a fork is, is just two different versions of history. That's what it is, okay? Two different versions of history is a fork. For example, uh, the red one, the red chain here, and the green chain here, they are forks because they do not have the exact, although at some point they share the same uh, parents, still up until this point or the latest one, they, do, they are not, they are completely two different uh, history, okay? Now, uh, there is usually, like I said, two blocks can be mined at the same time, two valid solutions can be mined at the same time, and a block takes time to propagate to the rest of the network. So it's usually the case that you can see a temporary fork or different view of what the current blockchain looks like from different miners perspective, okay? So that's a temporary fork, but this divergence of, of the current view of the blockchain states is gonna converge with as time goes along, as block being propagated to the rest of the network, okay? That's the idea. So the idea is that if you wanna have a higher confidence, which to go back to the question that you asked uh, about one hour ago, is that if you wait longer, long enough if you receive enough confirmation, then you will be sure that this block will gonna be part of history because no one has the kind of computational power to produce the block all the way back from this point. For let's say, if I already received this block, the red block over here, okay, you are pretty certain no one has the computational power to single-handedly build something from this point all the way and even build a longer chain than you do. That's highly unlikely. That is just highly unlikely. So with each block you knew, the probability of other people or, or, or something happened in the past being override or uh, overrun, it goes, goes down exponentially, okay? It's highly unlikely. So, uh, so confirmation, this is another terminology. It means that the depth or number of blocks, for example, I wanna know the confirmation of this block. It means that the depth from the latest mine block, which is this block, the red block over here, um, right now it's one, two, three, four, okay? So the depth is four, means, meaning that any transaction that's included in this block has a confirmation of four block. So confirmation block is number of block that you get to confirm. So it's like you have many children or predecessors after you, um, that's the confirmation you get. So it's the likelihood, so let, let's take a look at the likelihood uh, to attack with X confirmation, okay? Let me show you this slide. Okay, um, Okay. so can everyone see? Let's say <clears throat> I am a huge player. I have 20% of the entire computational power, which is huge, okay? It's like enormously huge. Remember the number of hashes that being calculated every, every second? So let's say I have 200, uh, sorry, I have, um, um, uh, twenty percent of the computational power, and I have uh, one confirmation, meaning that there's only one block after me that's being mined. So, what's the likelihood of someone revert the chain or attack? So, the, the probability is going to be forty percent, meaning that it's still very, very likely. It's pretty scary, right? Pretty scary. Um, oh, sorry, no. So, for, for for me to attack, sorry, for me to revert the chain. Okay, I have twenty percent. I'm trying to to revert the chain. Um, so, this is the probability. Okay, let's say let's wait um, three blocks. Okay, I wait for three blocks. Now my probability is reducing down to 10%. So what happens if we go to, let's say six block? 
Now, if I go to six blocks, as I can see, the probability for me to find to revert the chain is going to be only 1%. Now, I'm assuming I have 20% of the computational power, which is probably as powerful as NSA right now, which is all, almost all highly unlikely. Usually, what you will get, even if you are a mining pool sometimes, you know, at, you know individually, it's like very small. It's, as a whole, it's, it's pretty, pretty huge, right? Let's say if I'm only 2%, which is also huge. I don't think NTU can ever, can 2% or 1%, so even with pulling everything that NTU has, there's no way we have 2%. Um, still, as you can see, this is uh, 1.5 to the power of minus eight. That was like very, very small probability for me to revert the chain. So I, I hope this, this kind of uh, example gives you an idea that the longer you wait, the more confident you should be that something in the history is gonna end it up and locked up as the history, okay? No one is gonna revert the chain anymore. It's the, the likelihood as the chain grows of this, of this transaction or this block, the previous historical block being reverted is go, goes down exponentially. That's the idea. Okay, great. So the recommendation uh, by the Bitcoin protocol is that you wait six blocks, which, which is roughly one hour because every block interval is like 10 minutes, okay? So if you wait six block, then you know it's fairly confident. So of course, some people will ask, doesn't that mean that if I wanna buy something using Bitcoin, then I have to wait one hour? Isn't that too long to wait? It's like if I use Visa at that spot, it's like five seconds. So the answer is that it really depends on the value of your transaction, I think, right? So if you're transacting like a million dollar, then it's probably worth you to have higher confidence that something actually goes through to wait this six confirmation. If you're only transacting for, let's say, um, $5 of goods, then it probably doesn't really make sense for other people even to cheat or to, to does include an invalid transaction. So in a sense, you can even do a zero transaction, one confirmation or even zero confirmation, meaning that once the block has been produced, you can take it as it is, because like $5 doesn't provide any economic incentive for any, any people to just revert for that transaction. Doesn't make money, much sense, right? So that's the idea. Now, uh, another question, uh, maybe give me 10 more minutes. Another question is uh, why censorship resistance? So I, because the content time constraint, I'm just gonna explain it myself, uh, in a sense that even if you do not include some transaction, for example, someone wants to censor me, where you remember in the uh, central authority case, where the central authority has a say, absolute say, of who, which transaction get included, or what transaction do I process, but now in the Bitcoin case, there's a network, a mesh of nodes, and some you know, are honest and altruistic, who are willing to adhere to the protocol itself, who are willing to stick to the protocols, right? Um, then he will probably, you know, include my transaction as long as I pay, you know, average amount of transaction fee, which wasn't that much. But at this, at, at this time, because the price is high, so it's still quite a lot of money, but um, two years back is really not much, okay? And also, um, people think like 10 minutes is too long. So let me say that, um, or one hour is too long. So if you're trying to do a cross-continent or even cross-bank trans transfer, it's actually, although it's been processed at that time, it doesn't mean that it's been settled, right? It takes weeks to settle that because it's like at the end of the week, the bank's gonna clear house with each other. That's where they're match the, 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 the books and then clear all the uh, interbank transaction. So uh, it's still possible, even if you're doing a cross-bank transfer, it's possible that um, at the end of the week, you find out the, tra the transaction is gonna re get, get reverted or get invalidated. That's also possible. So the settlement time in real life is actually longer than people think, right? That's the point. Um, so let's go back to this chart that we started with. I hope everyone now understand what do I mean by each one of these uh, answers. Who maintained the ledger? Who notes? Who notes have all the information, including all the transaction and the block headers? Who decides which transaction to include? Individual miners. You have a say of which, which transaction you want to include. If you're a good guy, you are, you do not only include the one that pays you the most transaction fee, you can include any transaction that you feel like, you know, it's valid, okay? If you are a profit-making, profit-driven guy, you can just take the one that pays you the, the, the highest transaction fees. Uh, who gets to propose the next block? How working, how working in the sense you're doing a lot of computational power to get, to, to get the right proof-of-work uh, puzzles? And who gets to print the cash? Only the one who proposed a new block. That's the only stream of, in, a stream of new cash. Um, in Bitcoin cases. Now, uh, at, at this point, we have achieved three, all of the three lines of the goal. I hope you should be proud of yourself. We're, we're now successfully built a secure digital cache 
with pseudonymity and without central authority. Okay, these are the goals that we laid out last time, and we have already achieved it. So by this time, you should go back and read this Bitcoin white paper uh, without much of uh, you know difficulty to understand some of the technical details. Because if we let's imagine we start by asking everyone to read this paper, you could imagine that some of you may give up on the second page. So as I can see, um, that's one of the reasons we take this modular approach, decompose it into different, smaller, more manager, manageable and understandable pieces and then put them together, okay? So <clears throat> two more points. Um, it's like every time we want to extend your knowledge a little bit, other than just the basic itself, uh, first of all, is fork necessarily bad? Okay. It's like, uh, of course, people want consensus. People want one single version of the history. Why would I want two different versions, right? So there are two kinds of forks. The, the first one is called a hard fork. The second one is called a soft fork. The hard fork means that any changes to the protocol that's incompatible, that is not backward compatible, meaning that you, um, as, a, as a program, that, uh, as a node, the program that's running on your, on your network um, has to change. And um, anything that's happening in the new Protocol does not compat is not compatible with the previous one or the previous node. Those who didn't upgrade their software could not process the one that's coming from your software. That's called a hard fork. For example, B Bitcoin Cash. So Bitcoin Cash changed the parameters, the the, the hard coded parameters in Bitcoin case, which is the block size. So Bitcoin specified there's only one megabytes of uh, transaction that you can include in certain block, but now Bitcoin Cash says that's just too little. I want to increase this block size. Now, then they upgrade it to, I don't know, I think it's three, three megabytes or something. Uh, sorry, I think this is probably wrong, but they increase the block size. In a sense, they change the protocol hard-coded uh, parameter itself so that any transaction that's happening on Bitcoin Cash, the, the Bitcoin miners would not accept because that's not compatible with the, the, the protocol they, uh, they agree on or the program that they're running. So that's called a hard fork. So in a sense, you are creating this different um, di different different version of the history because you know you change something that is you know uh, not acceptable by the rest of it. So some of the example of hard fork, for example, the block size, as I just mentioned. Another example, if we want to change the hash function, we don't want to use the SHA-256 anymore. Let's use some other things. So if we change the hash function, then the rest of the network right now could not would not be able to verify the thing that I put up, right? So that will create effectively create another chain that has a different history. And uh, the, the, the miners on my chain is gonna using a different hash function. So that's a incompatible changes, basically, okay? So another thing is basically, uh, another possible thing is block reward. For example, let's say I'm not satisfied with the current, like there's a cap on Bitcoin supply. I wanna build something that's have infinite Bitcoin supply. Um, then I want to probably change the block reward system or the specify in the Bitcoin protocol in the sense I have to create a hard fork. Uh, in a sense, Ethereum is a hard fork uh, of Bitcoin, okay? But, but, okay, we will explain how that hard fork happens, and it's, it's slightly different from Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. The relationship between them is very, very different from, from them, and I will explain that in, I think, next, next, uh, next course, okay? Next lecture, okay? Another one is called soft fork. So soft core is something that's back, backward compatible, right, compared to soft fork, uh, uh, hard fork. What does that mean is that, for example, I want to introduce some new functionalities, okay? Why this doesn't break the compatibility is that when I introduce some new functionalities, the nodes who upgrade their software can process these new functionalities. Those who didn't just doesn't process, that's all. He could choose not to do that. And this functionality is not sort of like compulsory, it's just nice to have. For example, I increase some metadata or extra field that I want to include in my transaction, for example. And I want to add some, um, it, okay, we will later on introduce some color coin, for example, and then you can introduce some new functionalities that does not break. So the rest of the network can still process, can verify the transaction. It's just that it does not give you this um, new functionality that you, you, you're asking them to process or to execute, okay? Um, and, and in next semester, or if we have time this semester, we can, we can teach you how to write Bitcoin script uh, which is much harder. Uh, Bitcoin script is way harder, but it's a stack machine and we'll introduce later on. The next thing, of course, is the mining pool. And we already uh, say that. So the, is, or the, the reason why we, people want to start a mining pool is because we want to do this coordinated prob problem solving. Um, I don't want to 
everyone, we don't want to waste a lot of time calculating the same nonsense with the same hashes. So we want to do it in a coordinated ways so we don't waste much. Uh, and we want to do it together. Another thing is that uh, <clears throat> I want to reduce the variance on the return on investment, okay? Because if let's say I'm mining on my own laptop, it probably take me a million years to find the next block, which means the variance is very high. It might, I, I already died for another million years. It's, like, it's still not finding the next block, so there's no return at all. I want to reduce that variance by joining a pool, and effectively by joining this pool, um, when someone finds the next block, the, so the one who coordinated this will give me will give everyone in the pool, for example, some uh, little reward. So I have a little uh, a smaller variance. Or if I find something that's closer, like um, what Zichi mentioned, uh, if you find something that's that's close enough to to the actual problem, I find nine zero in front instead of ten, I can still get rewarded because as a mining pool, um, I, it, it proves that I actually contributing to the mining pool. I'm actually doing work. Okay, so that's also a one way to reduce my my ROI variance. So uh, of course, another problem is, is there a centralization risk if there are mining pools? Because we're pooling everyone's computational power together to do something, to solve this problem. And as we said, if someone has 51% 50, of the computational power, then he's dominating this, this, this race, this proof of work, this problem solving race, right? So is there a centralization risk? The answer is, of course, yes, there is. So it's very uh, alarming that uh, Bit, Bitmain actually right now control uh, nearly 46% of the uh, mining. So it's like they are selling all the hardware. And in the sense that if you want, let's say, let's assume that they have backdoor on all the hardware that they sell and they can coordinate those, those these, um, facilities. So the facility that they produce now together can calculate half the computational power of like 45, 46% of the entire network. Um, although the owner of those hardware might belong to different one, different people, right? It might belong to some US uh, even government, some you know, uh, individual identities, uh, sorry, individual, I don't know, miners. Um, but in a sense, there is this, uh, if they are coordinated together, and it's easy if you're using the same hardware, it's easy to coordinate, right? Then there is this centralization risk. But uh, once again, it's just that um, even if you are, I think one of the, uh, arguments that Vitalik usually have is that the social coordination is actually harder than theoretic ones. So theoretically, uh, so there are, that's why many people say that Bitcoin works better in reality than in theory. In, in theory. So in a sense, in theory, uh, Bitcoin might not work, may not even exist, should, shouldn't be you know, sustaining until today. Uh, but then because of the social coordination is so hard, and you know, colluding everyone and convincing everyone on board is very, very hard. It's like, how do we even the profit sharing, how do we share the profit, for example, right? And how do we prove that how much work, you should, how much you should get? Uh, or let's say if we collude, someone find the solution and doesn't ends up give, giving you the money. And how do you do that? Uh, everything, uh, the social coordination adds an extra layer of uh, this kind of uh, centralization resistance, right? Okay, so up until this point, I think we have a really great, um, detail and overview of how Bitcoin works and the Bitcoin protocols. I hope this is clearer than most of the lectures out there or any of the workshop that you attended. Uh, I hope you take away something. Um, then assignment for today, uh, for the next two weeks is gonna be, uh, first of all, you have to visualize the Bitcoin consensus flow. Um, once again, you will be receiving the lecture recording as well as the slides. So um, you should go through the it took me quite a while to produce uh, to to make those diagrams. So it's nice to have a visual representation instead of just words, right? So you should go through the the, the flow yourself. Um, then the, the reading, of course, is uh, the same the same blog post. I think some of you might read it. So the uh, the last time we asked you to read the first half. So this time is the second half. Okay. Then the next reading is the Bitcoin white paper. Okay. I hope some I, I knew some of you already read the uh, Princeton textbook uh, chapter one. And some of you already asked very, very good question. I think by un up until this point, the question that you, you ask has already been answered in, our, in this workshop, okay? And right now, it's your job to read Bitcoin white paper. Guys, Bitcoin white paper, please, please go, go back and read it. And if you have any question, post your question on, uh, uh, on Telegram. Um, and then in terms of thinking, the first one is, what are some problems with proof of work? Okay? This is the one I, I, I think everyone should think. No, this is, it's, it's not hard, okay? What are some of the problems of proof of work? Then um, if you have extra time, so you can still continue on thinking uh, how, do, how do you 
uh, do a proof of non-membership in Merkle Tree. Okay, so that's the all assignments that we have, and thank you very much. That's all.